I didn't just say some magic words and all this take place. Well, there's been many, many hours of hard labor that has gone into the reconstruction of this tabernacle. And you have a lovely place. And I thank God for it. It seems to me like it's just a little bit quieter than it was when I was here before. Now, if the reconstruction of the building has caused this, then I'm in favor of putting it back like it was. <laughs> but let's all keep our hearts open. Mind God and let him have his wonderful way. Amen. It's wonderful to be a Christian, I say again this evening to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful family of God. I felt the Lord would have us to talk to us for just a little while tonight concerning this matter of prayer. You know, I suppose, I suppose the root of all failure in our Christian life is in our lack of prayer are in our failure to pray. Let me say that again. The root of all failure in our Christian life is in our lack of prayer or in our failure to pray and seek the face of God. Do you pray? You know, they took a poll some time back and they found that the average Christian prays two to three minutes a day. I wonder if we heard that. The average Christian prays two to three minutes a day. But you know, I read that they also took another poll. They found out that the average American watches television a little more than seven hours a day. You know, that lets me know why God is not giving us a revival in America. We had an evangelist that came to our church when I was pastoring. I never will forget after he'd been there for three or four services. He got up one night and he said... Uh, how many, how many people have prayed for this revival effort? How many of you prayed two hours today? He said, raise your hand. I think maybe one hand went up. He said, how many prayed an hour today? Another hand or two went up. He said, how many of you prayed just 30 minutes today? Maybe another hand or two went up. Then he paused for a moment. He said, did you see that lady come into the service tonight? She had her hair all messed up, hanging down on one side, had on a ragged dress, and it was dipped down, way down on one side. And about that time, I became, I became just a little bit embarrassed because I, I wondered who in the world is is he talking about? And I wanted to sort of turn and look around. He paused for a moment. He said, no. He said, you didn't see anybody come into service like that. He said, every one of you, before you came to this service, he said, you went before the mirror. You made sure that your hair was all in place. You made sure the outward man had been taken care of. He said, no, nobody came in the service like that. But he said, some of you came to service like that spiritually. He said, you came just as you were. You didn't take time to check up on the inner man at all. God help. God help. Someone asked Emily Post, what is the correct procedure when one is invited to the White House? but has a previous engagement. She said an invitation to lunch or dine at the White House is a command and automatically cancels any other engagement. 
Someone else said nothing lies outside the reach of prayer except that which lies outside the will of God. In the book of Matthew, chapter 6 and 5, Jesus said, And when thou prayest, I want to ask you again, do you pray? <laughs> he assumed that everybody prays that is supposed to be a Christian. He said, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, Enter into thy closet. <laughs> Don't you appreciate the closet? <laughs> oh, friend, I've had some of the greatest times of my entire experience in the closet. <laughs> but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Oh, my friend tonight, God wants to give us some open reward, but there's very little open reward in this day in which we live because there's so little secret praying. You say, but Brother Newton, is, is praying, is prayer that important? You know, friend, we don't act like it's very important, do we? I'll be honest with you, I feel the greatest ministry on earth is in the ministry of prayer. Jesus Christ said the servant is no greater than his Lord. And friend, tonight if prayer was important to Jesus Christ, it certainly ought to be important to us. You say, well, Brother Newton, how important was prayer to Jesus Christ? Let's notice just a little bit. You know, to Jesus Christ, prayer was more important than his ministry of teaching and healing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Luke 5 and 12 says, And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who, seeing Jesus, fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. Listen, and immediately the leprosy departed from him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priest and offer for thy cleansing according as Moses commanded for testimony unto them. But so much the more went their fame abroad of him, and great multitudes gathered to gather to hear yes, and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Listen. And he departed into the wilderness and prayed. You know, friend, to Jesus Christ, the ministry of healing, the ministry of teaching was one of the reasons why I came to this world. And friend, it was so important to Jesus Christ to continue in the ministry of healing and teaching. But right in the midst of this ministry, The Bible tells us he separated himself from it. He departed into the wilderness and there prayed. You know, friend, I've often said, no amount of work, nor labor, nor activity, nor service, no matter how legitimate it may be, can make up for or atone for our lack of devotion to Jesus Christ. And sometime, right in the midst of very important things in life, friend, we have to slip away. We have to get along with God and get our strength renewed in Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord 
shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Yes, to Jesus Christ. The ministry of prayer at times was more important than his ministry of teaching and healing. I want you to notice further tonight that to Jesus Christ many times prayer was more important than even rest for his body. Mark chapter 135 says, And in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Friend, if if it was important for Jesus Christ to rise up a long time, quite a while before day, and go out to a solitary place and there seek the face of his Father, if that was important for Jesus Christ, I wonder how much more important it is that we should somehow sacrifice a little rest if need be. To find the place of prayer and be consistent in this matter of seeking his faith. I remember a number of years ago when we became involved in school work. Brother, the telephone would ring early in the morning and through the day, obligations all through the day grabbed our attention. And even on till late at night. And it seemed like that my prayer life was being eroded away. And I became desperate. I said, oh God, I don't want to neglect my prayer life. I've got to have some help. Oh God, what am I going to do? And the Lord spoke to my heart and said, son, said, set your alarm clock an hour before the rest of the family gets up. And so I set my alarm clock an hour before the rest of them got up. You know, I found out man can get along on five or six hours of sleep just as well with the help of God as it can get on with seven or eight hours of sleep. You remember Job rose up early in the morning? He rose up and offered up sacrifice for his children. He said, lest they have sinned. He didn't want his children to be lost. Oh, my friend, we don't have to build an altar out here and offer up a burnt offering or sacrifice, but aren't you glad once and for all Jesus Christ has been offered up for the sins of mankind? And what a privilege it is. What a privilege it is to go to the great throne of grace and plead the sacrifice for our children. I'll confess to you tonight, friend, I try my best to plead that sacrifice every day for my lost children. Not just, well, I only have one boy that's lost, not just for my lost boy and for his wife, but I plead the blood for my other children also. I try to pray for my wife every day. Thank God for a good companion. I'll tell you, friend, you ought to take it on your heart to pray for some preacher's wife. They fight a tremendous battle. But I try to pray for my wife and for Regina and for David and Sharon, Sabrina and Katrina and Ivan and for Jeff and Pam and Jessica and Matthew and Natalie and Dwayne and Gwen and Chad and Jody and Thad and Heidi and Cheryl and Steve and Stephanie and Sean and Scott. Friend, that's my children and my grandchildren. I didn't bring children in this world to be lost. But oh, friend, I've pled and I'm going to continue to plead that God in his mercy will get my children through to the throne of God. Job rose up early and offered sacrifice. Yes, he did. That's just children at sin. Susanna Wesley gave birth to 19 children. No doubt that woman faced many responsibilities and obligations 
with such a large family. But I read somewhere where Susanna Wesley rose up an hour before her family rose from their beds. She had a solitary place out there. She had a place where she went and she met with God. She was determined that by the grace and help of God, the devil wasn't going to get her children. Thank God there was a John Wesley that came forth from that crowd. And a John and a Charles Wesley that came from that crowd. I thought about a man that we had came and worked and labored on our grounds for perhaps a couple of years. He always had such a radiant testimony, such a shine on his face. That man was saved late in life. And I heard him testify after he'd been saved for 10 years. I heard him get up and testify one time. And he told how, because he was saved late in life, that he promised God he'd give him the first hour of every day. And he said, for the most part, I rise up at 4 o'clock in the morning. He said, sometimes I get so involved in this matter of prayer and studying the Word of God, he said it's not just an hour. Sometimes it'll last for two or three hours. But he said, I haven't missed a day in 10 years. <laughs> oh, you say, what are you talking about, preacher? More important to Jesus Christ at times than even the physical rest for his body. I want you to notice, Father, that prayer to Jesus Christ was more important than sleep. On some occasions, you remember again the Bible says in Luke 6 and 12, it says it came to pass in those days that he went out and departed into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. You know, I really don't even like to mention this. I look at my track record, and I'm so ashamed. Yeah. But I wonder tonight, friend, how many of us have even spent a night? God oh, I thank God for a few nights. God. But how many of us have even spent a night alone in prayer to God? Went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. You know, it might be interesting if I just asked for a show of hands. But don't get uneasy. I'm not going to ask for that. Brother Rob French made the statement one time. I heard him say, he said, I can't remember a single Saturday night when I was coming up. I can't remember a single Saturday night that my mother didn't spend all night in prayer to God. After the chores of the day were all laid aside, he said, my mother had a little place up in the attic and said she'd climb up that little ladder and she'd find that place of prayer. He said, I used to go up there with her. And he said, it was such a delight to pray. He said, I'd try to pray all night, but he said, I couldn't. He said, I'd become sleepy. And he said, I had a little pallet up there, and I'd lay down on the pallet and go to sleep. But he said, when I'd wake up in the morning, he said, my mother was still on her knees and said there was a puddle of tears where she had wrestled all night in prayer. She was determined the devil wasn't going to get a single one of her children. And listen, friend, the devil didn't get a one of them. One man made the statement about the church where he was saved. He said he had such respect for his pastor because his pastor every now and then would take some of the more consecrated Christians in the church 
and he said they would go into his study on Saturday night and spend all night in prayer. He said on one particular night while they were praying, there was a, a dentist that was winging his way home late at night because he was a drinking dentist. Around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning it was, as he was coming by the church, he happened to see a light on in one of the rooms that happened to be the study of the church. So he went up and tried the front door and it was open. So he walked in and he went to the room where the light was on and when he opened up the door, he saw that host of saints on their faces weeping and groaning before God and immediately old-fashioned conviction gripped his heart. And this man said that Dennis wept his way through to God in the study that night. More important to Jesus Christ on some occasions than sleep. Friend, I wonder what would happen to us in this camp if a spirit of real, genuine, intercessory prayer would grip our hearts to the place where we would be willing to give up a little rest. We'd be willing to sacrifice some sleep in order to seek the face of God that the Holy Ghost might settle down and God might come on this camp like he wants to come. Amen. Amen. I noticed, Father, to Jesus Christ, prayer was more important than working of miracles. You see, friend, Jesus Christ could have worked a miracle to deliver Peter from the power of Satan. Oh, yes, I know that there were occasions when Jesus worked miracles, but on some occasions it seemed that prayer was more important than working of miracles. You remember Jesus Christ said concerning Peter, when Satan tried to devour him, he said, Satan, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Oh, friend, tonight, I'm so glad for the blessed Holy Ghost that every now and then <laughs> when we go to prayer and we don't know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession with us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Aren't you glad also that there's one at the right hand of the throne of God? He's there ever to make intercession for us. Aren't you glad that he's there so that he can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities? You know, some people seem to feel that if they can't do something big, if they can't do something spectacular, that they're not accomplishing very much. I remember hearing Brother O.L. Fay tell about a little invalid girl. I think she was around 12, 14 years old. This little girl loved the Lord with all of her heart, but she was bedfast. They had uh, her bed beside a little window in the upstairs room there so that she could look out the window. She could watch the birds and watch the rabbits as they hopped along, and she could watch Mother Nature and this little girl loved to read her Bible. She would look out the window sometimes and just across the valley there was a railroad track where the train came around the track, around the mountain, and then that train would go on up the valley. And she'd watch that big train as it came around that bend every night about 10 o'clock and then started on up the valley. But one day while she was reading in her Bible, she read that verse of Scripture where it said, Let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And while she was praying and seeking the Lord, she began to weep and she said, Oh God, she said, I hardly ever see anybody but my immediate family. She said, Oh God, how can I let my light shine before men? And the Lord spoke to that little girl's heart and said, Daughter, if you'll just take a match and strike that match, and every night when that big train comes around the bend, around that mountain and starts up the valley, just take that match and wave it in front of that window. Just wave it back and forth. Well, the little girl didn't understand how that was going to let her light shine, but she asked her mother if she could have a box of matches, and her mother brought one of those big mock boxes of matches into her. And that night about 10 o'clock when the train came around the bend, that little girl took out one of those matches and she struck it, and then she waved it in front of the window pane back and forth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, there was an old wicked engineer on that train, and when he came around the bend, in the distance he saw a peculiar light going back and forth, back and forth. He called attention to the fellow that was in the cab with him. He said, what is that light? What is that peculiar light over there going back and forth? Well, I said, I don't know. I've never seen that before. But you know, when they came back the next night, the light was in front of the window. It was going back and forth. They got word to one of the conductors, and he got word to others on the train. And friend, after a while, when the train would come around the bend and start up the valley, everybody on that train had their face looking out the windows of those cars, and they could see a light in the distance going back and forth back and forth. Well, brother, that old train engineer, his curiosity became so aroused until one day he decided that he was going to make up a little extra time, so he gave that old train a little more throttle, made up quite a bit of time, and when he came around the bend, he saw the light going back and forth he sent word back through the train that he was bringing this train to a halt. He said, I'm going to find out what that light is. That big old wicked engineer came out of that cab and he walked across the valley. And when he got to the spot where it seemed the light was coming from, there was a lo lovely little white house there. And he said, surely this is where the light came from. And he knocked on the front door. And the mother answered the door. The engineer asked him about that strange light that appeared every night. He said, from this spot. And the mother dropped her head and she said, I'm sorry, but I don't know anything about a strange light. And while she was talking, she happened to think about that box of matches that her little girl had asked for. She said, just a moment, sir. And she invited him in. And they walked up the stairs and went into that room. And that little girl, invalid, afflicted, laying there on the bed, when they approached her about a strange light, she told them how, when she was reading God's Word, that he spoke to her. Her heart, as she read those words, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. She told how that as she prayed and sought God and asked him how she could let her light shine because she hardly ever saw anyone other than her immediate family, how the Lord has spoke to her 
and said, if you'll just light a match every night when the big train comes around the bed, put it in front of the window pane and wave it back and forth, you can let your light shine. And she seemed to rejoice in the fact that she was letting her light shine. But oh, friend, that she testified. That old wicked train engineer, Holy Ghost conviction gripped his heart. He thought to himself, oh, would God love me? Would God love me to put this on the heart of a little girl? He bowed on his knees and prayed through to victory right there in that room. And the story went that he went back to the train and some of the conductors and many on the train, when they heard the testimony and heard the story, they too sought the face of God and prayed through. I say to us again, friend, some of the greatest victories that have ever been won, some of the greatest miracles that have ever occurred and became desperate. They sought God in the place of prayer. Oh, we don't have to do something great, something spectacular. If somehow we can just be faithful to seek His face, He'll show us what to do and how to let our light shine. Then I want you to notice, Father, tonight that to Jesus Christ, prayer was more important than money or machinery in, in choosing laborers for his vineyard. You remember Jesus spent all night in prayer before he chose his 12 disciples. And in Matthew 9, 36, it says, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. I don't know how you feel about it tonight, but friends, I feel like we're in the 11th hour. We're right in the very end of this dispensation. And if ever there was a day when we needed laborers into the vineyard, it's in this hour in which we live. I remember about the last word that our pastor there in Salisbury, Brother Free, when we left, he said, Brother Newton, tell Brother Gray that we need a principal. We need someone for our Christian day school. Ask him if he knows anybody that we could get. I've thought about the first time in my ministry, friend, the first time we've gone through an entire conference year with two of our churches closed because we couldn't get pastors for them. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God help us. Shake us. Help us. We're living in a day when the harvest is ripe and the laborers are few. Right. A lot of preachers are throwing in the towel. They're hanging up their, their, their shingle. They're quitting. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I remember one year when we were over the school, I had about six or seven camps that summer. But we needed laborers. We needed some teachers desperately in the school. And I didn't have time to solicit for help. But oh, so earnestly, I was seeking God and praying, oh God, give us laborers, give us laborers, give us some teachers for our school. You know, friend, God sent us two of the best teachers we ever had there at Salisbury Christian School. I didn't solicit that in one camp meeting, one of those teachers with a master's degree. She came up to me she said, Brother Newton, would you happen to have an opening in your school? A lot of you folk know her. She may be here tonight. It was Sister Bert. 
Oh, she made such a wonderful teacher. And then I was in another camp meeting just before school was to start in Michigan. And, and another lady walked up to me and said, Brother Newton, I feel like I've been teaching in the public school, but I feel like God wants me to teach in a Christian school. She said, would you have an opening? Brother Sister Kimberlin came to our school, two of the best teachers, some of the best we've ever had. Oh, friend, he said, pray you there for the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers into his harvest. I've been desperate this year. I really don't know why these churches that we have, they're just little small churches. They don't even have a parsonage. Whoever would come would have to work. Just a little handful of people in each church and I thought, oh God, as we have prayed and sought his face, why can't you lay your hand on somebody that, that's interested enough? God help you. God help you. For some reason, some reason, our church doors have been closed practically all year. Friend, we're in the eleventh hour. The harvest is ripe. It seems there's so few laborers that's willing to go into the field to labor. Yes, prayer was important to Jesus Christ. More important on some occasions than his ministry of teaching and healing. More important than rest. More important than sleep. More important and money and machinery and securing workers. More important at times than working miracles. I want to ask you, friend, is prayer important to you? Is it? You say, but Brother Newton, I have such a struggle. Somebody said, oh, Brother Newton, I can't get up early in the morning. I'm a night person. <laughs> I can't get out of bed early because I feel so bad. Really, that's not true. The reason you don't get out of bed is because you feel so good. But you know, George Mueller listed, he listed five or six reasons why our prayers may be ineffective. I want us to notice about three of these. Friends, it may be that our prayers are not getting through to the throne of grace because the first reason he said there must be separation from all known sin. Right, right. You remember David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's why David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Friend, I wonder if we're willing for the blessed Holy Ghost just to turn the searchlight of heaven in on our souls. See if there's any unconfessed sin. Separation from all known sin. Isaiah said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot Say, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. He said, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Could it be, friend, that we refuse to go to the place of prayer because we know we're not going to get through anyhow? Because there's willful sin in our heart or in our life. 
Don't ever forget, God said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Said there must be separation from all known sin. And then the second thing, he said there must be importunity in supplication. Waiting on God and waiting for God as the husbandman has, hath long patience to wait for the harvest. I remember some years ago there was a lady that got so blessed she testified and she shouted the victory at the Bell St. O camp meeting. She was rejoicing because her husband had prayed through and because he had the victory. Then she said, you know, folks, she said, I have prayed earnestly for my husband for 27 years. She said, but God answered prayer. He's in. Another lady got up and shouted and testified in a service. She said, folk, she said, I'm rejoicing because my husband prayed. For she said, I've been praying for him for more than 30 years. Importunity and supplication. Jesus said in Luke 5, or Luke 11 and 5, he said, Which of you shall have a friend and shall say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Jesus said, I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity will he rise and give him as many as he needeth, or because of his continual coming, because of the fact that he just will not quit knocking. And I say unto you, ask. And keep on asking. That's the way. That's what it means in the original. Ask and keep on asking, and it shall be given you. Seek and keep on seeking, and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking, and it shall be open unto you. For every one that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. I heard Dr. Yoakum tell about on one occasion when he decided that he wanted God to teach him to pray. And he said, I decided, oh God, it doesn't seem that my prayers are availing very much. And he decided to go into his room and seek God that he would give him a genuine lesson in prayer. And Brother Yoakum said as he was kneeling beside his bed and quietly seeking the Lord, he said, uh, my little girl came slipping into the room. And he said she walked up back of me and began to tap me on the back And, he said, and she said, Daddy, he said, oh, I, I was seeking a lesson from God. He said, I didn't want to be disturbed. But he said, she just kept tapping and said, Daddy, would you put the shoe on my dolly? He said, I sort of brushed her side. And he said, I told her, daughter, honey, I'm, daddy's trying to pray. Daddy's here 
try and seek God. I'm trying to get a lesson in prayer, on prayer from God. Said, said, honey, just run along. Said, daddy, I'll, daddy, I'll put the shoe on later. And he said, my little girl left the room. But he said it wasn't too long until she came back in again. And he said she didn't come slipping up behind me this time, tapping me on the back. He said she came right around, crawled up on the bed, and said she crawled across the bed and got both of her hands under my chin and lifted my head up and said, Daddy, will you put the shoe on my dolly now? <laughs> and Brother Yoakum said, I was somewhat tried and just a little bit disgusted, but he said, I couldn't resist. He said, I, I took the little doll and I put the shoe on the little dolly's foot. He said, my little girl went running on back. And he said, I got in earnest again, seeking the Lord for my lesson in prayer and said, now, Lord, give me a lesson as to how I can get my prayer through and he said, all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me and said, Son, I just gave you the lesson. <laughs> Importunity in supplication. Luke 18. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Luke 18 and 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. The Bible says that he would not for a while but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? He said, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. Oh, my friend tonight, are we so close to the coming of the Lord until there's very little persevering faith? That faith that gets a hold of the horns of the altar and holds on and holds on until the answer comes through. Brother John Church said years ago he was at the Caraway Memorial Methodist Church in Greensboro for a revival effort. He said God was giving a great revival, and he said they were having great altar services. He said on this particular Friday night after he had preached, he said the altar was lined with seekers. He said, I noticed over to my right there was an old white-haired lady. He said she was just a humble cotton mill woman. He didn't know whether she could read or write or not, but he said he knew one thing. She could read her title clear to a mansion in the sky, and he said he knew she could pray because he heard her get a hold of the horns of the altar at a camp meeting one time and just shook fire all over everything. He said, I called her by name and said, Sister, I wonder if you'd come down here tonight and lead us in prayer around this altar. He said, uh, we sure need God. said, if you ever did get a hold of God, said, I hope you'll get a hold of him tonight. And he said that lady got up out of her seat and walked down that long aisle, said she dropped down on both knees, sort of sat back on her heels, pushed back that old split bonnet, said she looked like she'd taken the job by the contract and wasn't going to quit until the thing was done. He said she prayed 
until those seekers begin to pop up from the altar like popcorn and go back through the congregation rejoicing. And he said after all of them had left the altar, she was still praying. In fact, he said she got lost in prayer, and he said, I began to listen to her. He said, I became interested in what she was talking to the Lord about. She had a long lost boy, wicked boy. He left home. She didn't know where he was. And she was reminding the Lord of some of his promises that he had made. She said, Lord, you said if we would abide in you and your words would abide in us, we could ask what we will and it shall be done. She said, now, Lord, you know that I'm abiding in you and your words are abiding in me. She said, now, Lord, I want you to find my boy. She said, I don't know where he is, but you do. She said, I can't find him, but you can. I can't bring him home, but, Lord, you can. And he said, she said, Lord, you said if any two on earth would agree as touching any one thing that it shall be done. She said, now, Lord, you know that husband and I have agreed that not a single one of our children are going to be lost. She said, husband's on one end of that promise, and I'm on the other end, and all of our children in between. And she said, Lord, before a single one of our children can be completely lost, she said, that promise will have to break. And Brother Church said she just kept reminding the Lord of what he had promised to do until she prayed clear through. And he said she came up from that altar and she walked up and down the aisles and clapped her hands and shouted the victory and said, Brother Church, my boy is going to be saved. My boy is going to be saved. She said, I know it just as much as if I'd seen him bow at this altar tonight. And Brother Church said three years later, I was at Connolly Springs, North Carolina, in a camp meeting. He said I had just preached in the Sunday afternoon service, and we'd had the closing prayer, and he said I looked up from the podium, and he said I saw that old white-haired lady come walking down the aisle with a great big red-faced fella interlocked in her arm. He said when she got right close, she looked up and she began to laugh. She said, Brother Church, do you remember when I prayed so hard for my boy at Caraway Memorial Methodist Church in Greensboro? He said, well, sister, I'll never forget it as long as I live. She said, well, Brother Church said, here he is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. She said, God has saved him. Not only that, but she said, God's called him to preach. <laughs> Brother Church said that young man stood there that afternoon, gave him this testimony. He said, Brother Church, the same night that my mother prayed at Caraway Memorial Methodist Church in Greensboro, he said, I was out in Kansas City, Missouri in a gambling den. He said, about 9.30. Something came over me that made me so sick and so disgusted with the way I was living and the crowd I was running with. He said, I threw my cards on the table and pushed in the chips and said, fellas, I'm a quitting. He said, I ought to be ashamed of myself to even be in a dive like this. Why, well, he said, I've got one of the godless old white-haired mothers that ever lived and said, somehow I feel like she's praying for me right now. He said, I went to my hotel room and I paced back and forth and got so homesick. He said, I decided I'd pack my suitcase and go home. I tell you, friend, God knows. God knows how to make them homesick. He said, I packed my little things together. He said, I caught a train out of Kansas City, Missouri. And he said, I had a long layover in St. Louis, Missouri. And while I was waiting for my next train, he said, I wandered down the street a little ways and there was a little lighthouse mission. He said, I went into the mission and the preacher preached. And he said, Brother Church, I went to the altar 
and I gave my heart to Jesus and he saved me. And he said, since then, since then, God has called me to preach. And he said, already, I'm serving in a little mountain circuit up here near Asheville, North Carolina. He said, Brother Church, I'm here in answer to my mother's prayer. <laughs> Brother Church said, friends, I don't mean to be extravagant, and I don't mean to be flippant, and I'm not taking any flight of oratory. When I say to you that I believe God Almighty would abdicate his throne in glory, drive the holy angels from his presence, dig up the golden streets of the new Jerusalem, take the pearly gates off their hinges, and throw them at the stars in infinite space before he would fail to keep his promise. <laughs> Hallelujah! <laughs> before he would fail to keep his promise, fulfill his promise, and do the things he's under obligation to his children to do. He said, if you're a child of God and walking in every ray of light, he said, you have the right to step out on the promises of God and call God in high heaven to witness that you have a claim on him. He said, God will move heaven and earth to answer you. There must be importunity in supplication. And then in closing, friend, he said there must be faith. There must be faith in the Word of God. Jesus said, what things wherever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Amen. Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I told the Lord so many times, oh God, I don't know how to pray, and friend, tonight I don't. I don't know how to pray. I've never been able to make a pretty prayer, but I do know how to get in earnest, and I know how to diligently seek after God. And I believe if somehow we would earnestly, diligently seek his face and faith believing, I believe God can get through to us in this camp meeting and give a few more brands from the burning souls into glorious victory ere this camp meeting comes to a close. Would you stand with us? Shake hands with your neighbor. You're dismissed. <laughs>